five. Clay Thompson is 27. It's time for Warriors Wrap Up. We'll bring you into the locker room and hear from Coach Kerr and the players. Highlights from the game. Warriors Wrap Up starts now. Yes, it does. What a win for the Warriors down in Houston. Final score, 133 to 110. The Warriors have won six consecutive games, and now you got a lot of room between yourselves and the Rockets for 10th in the Western Conference with the win. The Warriors are now 42 and 34. The Rockets fall to 38 and 38. The Warriors have a full four game advantage over the Houston Rockets. Plus the tiebreaker, so essentially a five-game advantage with six games left. It is not mathematically impossible just yet, uh, but I'll be willing to bet any amount of money that you could possibly lay down on the table. The Houston Rockets will not be catching the Golden State Warriors this year. At the very worst, the Golden State Warriors will be the 10th seed in the Western Conference. But some interesting developments elsewhere in the Western Conference standings. Maybe the Warriors can get out of the 10 spot in the West. We can talk a little bit about that later on here on Warriors Wrap Up. Welcome in, everybody. Mark Randy with you on 95.7 The Game, 888-957-9570. That's the number to call. It's also the Xfinity Mobile text line. A lot to get into tonight as the Warriors win in Houston. Entering the night, the Warriors were sitting on their fourth five-game win streak of the season. The previous three instances... That streak ended on the sixth game. They have not won six consecutive games all season long until tonight. A 133-110 to win over the Houston Rockets. The highlight you just heard coming in. Shout out to Kevin Dana doing a great job filling in for Tim Roy today. You'll hear him again tomorrow when the Warriors travel to take on the Dallas Mavericks. Another big game, uh, but it was the Clay Thompson show, especially in the first three quarters of this basketball game. Clay Thompson finished with 29 points, 11 of 15 from the field, made seven threes, made seven of his 11 three-point attempts. He was awesome. It was a classic Clay first half. He had 21 points in the first half alone, 8 of 11 from the field in the first half, 5 of 8 from deep in the first half. He was incredible in this game, and it wasn't just like the Rockets were doing a bad job defensively against him. He was hitting tough shot after tough shot after tough shot. It felt like a 2019 clay game is what it reminded me of. When he gets in those zones, it doesn't matter if he's fading away. It doesn't matter if there's two hands in his face. It doesn't matter if he's off balance, leaning left, leaning right, leaning forward. If he's 30 feet from the basket it does not matter when clay gets in those modes he does not miss uh it hasn't happened as often this year as in years past but it happened tonight 29 points on incredible efficiency 11 of 15 from the field again for clay 7 of 11 from downtown and how about the splash bros together steph curry and clay thompson both scoring 29 points they combine in this game for 58 points in this game, 58 points between the two. Uh, they go from the field 20 for 29 and 9 for 17 from downtown. And you compare that with what those two guys did against Dallas on Tuesday at Chase Center. It's the complete opposite game. Now, what's interesting is the Warriors won both of those games. But on Tuesday against Dallas, Steph and Clay co combined for just 27 points in 16 total minutes. The two combined for 60 minutes on Tuesday, scoring 27 total points. I'm talking about Stephen Clay here. They were 10 for 32 combined from the field on Tuesday against Dallas. Tonight, they both score more than they combined for uh, on Tuesday. They each scored individually more than their total output between the two of them from Tuesday. They both scored 29. They scored 58 total. They go 20 for 29 from the field. They make nine of their 17 threes. Again, in 60 total minutes between the two of them, they put up nearly 60 points total. Uh, those two scoring about a point a minute. In their minutes, in fact, for Clay, he scored a point a minute tonight. 29 minutes played, 29 points scored. Curry got up to 31 minutes played, and he scored 29. And then you got Trace Jackson Davis scoring a career-high 20 points in another start. He was 8 for 10 from the field. So if you want to continue with the uh, combination numbers, the statistics from Steph, Clay, and TJD, how about this for a trio? 
Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Trace Jackson Davis, 78 combined points in this game on 28 for 39 shooting. That's pretty good. That's pretty good from your starting point guard, your starting shooting guard, and your starting center. 78 combined points, 28 for 39 shooting. The Warriors cruised to a victory against the Rockets. They led wire to wire. It was uh, a little bit of a frustrating first half at times because the Warriors were up big. They were shooting lights out in Houston. And then, you know, their bugaboo for a lot of the season had been turnovers. They committed 15 turnovers in the first half. It was really the only reason why it was not like a 30-point lead at halftime for the Warriors because Houston was not shooting well. The Warriors could not miss, specifically from downtown, uh, and they needed to put together a little bit of a run to close the first half just to have a lead up to 15. It was a 9-0 Warriors run to close the second quarter, took a 6-point lead to a 15-point lead going into halftime. That 15-point lead felt a little more... I don't know, accurate in terms of the level of play uh, between these two teams through 24 minutes, but 15 turnovers for the Warriors led to 20 Rockets points in the first half. In all, the Warriors committed 21 turnovers tonight, leading to 27 points off turnovers for the Houston Rockets, and this was kind of an anomaly of a basketball game because for the first time in Warriors history, they had committed 15 or more turnovers in a first half and led by 15 or more points. They committed 15 turnovers in the first half, and they led by 15 points. Again, a big part of that was because uh, they closed on that 9 nothing run uh, to end the first half. Uh, that was probably the biggest stretch of this basketball game. You're up six, feeling like you had dominated the first half, and then you go on a 9 nothing run. You finally take care of the ball for, the, for a stretch, and the lead balloons to 25. You pushed it up to 20 in the third quarter. The Rockets would fight back it within 14 here and there, uh, but you never felt too threatened in the second half. And ultimately, you cruise in the fourth quarter. You could pull out Steph, Clay, Draymond, and company for the final four, three, three or four minutes or so and, and get them rested up for the back-to-back tomorrow in Dallas. And ultimately, you win 133 to 110. And you feel really good about yourself because now, if you're the Warriors, you've won six consecutive games. You continue your road dominance. How about this? The Warriors have now won five consecutive road games. They're 14-3 and three in their last 17 games on the road, uh, and they picked up a huge win over the Houston Rockets to distance themselves uh, from the Rockets for 10th place in the Western Conference standings. A four-game advantage for the Warriors plus the tiebreaker. You can think of it as a five-game advantage for the Warriors with only six games left in the regular season for both teams. It would take the Warriors uh, to win zero or one games and the Rockets to win all of their games or, you know, lose only one. That's the only way the Rockets have a chance. So it seems very, very unlikely uh, that the Warriors will slip past the Houston Rockets. Warriors will be the 10 seed at the very worst in the Western Conference. And considering what the conversation was like even a week ago, 10 days ago, um, that's that's a sigh of relief if you are the Golden State Warriors because you weren't thinking about getting out of the plane. You were thinking about just making the plane, and now the Warriors are pretty, pretty comfortably sitting at the very worst at the 10th spot in the Western Conference. All right, a lot to get to here on Warriors Wrap-Up. It's Mark Randy with you. 888-957-9570. That's the number to call if you want to join the program. It's also the x the mobile text line. Uh, we got a ton to get into, and let's begin by getting out to the phone lines. Uh, Drew Down in Tracy, first in line. Uh, Drew Down, what's up? You're on Warriors Wrap Up on 95.7 The Game. How you doing, Drew? Hey, good evening to the knockout champ, Mark Grandy. Uh, <laughs> man, i never seen a team so locked in on offense and so sloppy at the same time with the turnovers in that, in that first half. Uh, yeah, like you said, you, you hit the nail on the head, man. Up 15 with 15 turnovers. Uh, they should have been up 25, but um, they, they definitely, you know, they cleaned it up in the second half. And this was a, you know, a throwback Splash Brothers game. Man, Clay Thompson was in the zone. I love his chemistry, you know, with Trey, uh, with Trey Jackson Davis. Uh, Curry was hilarious when he finally got a foul call. <laughs> you know, just trolling the ref, bumping his chest when he got that foul call. I, I love it. So just a throwback Splash Brothers game. And Trey Jackson Davis, man, he just continues to impress. In my opinion, I think he's the best big man we've had since Bogut. 
Um, and, and, you know, starting him at the five um, kind of allows Dre to be that center fielder, that, that free safety and kind of roam around and not have to worry so much about, you know, protecting the rim and, and erase mistakes on the perimeter. Um, and without Sengun, I thought um, the Rockets definitely, you know, they didn't have much of an inside presence. You know, Landale got some boards and, you know, had a couple of dunks in there. But um, I thought TJ did a great job. And, yeah, with no Sengun, you know, they, they definitely didn't have much of an inside presence. You know, the bench shipped in Moody, GP2, Chris Paul. But this game was uh, definitely all about the starter. So great win. And then uh, Tari Eason. This man, man, he he must have never been around an open flame or a hot stove as a kid because when you play with fire, man, you get burned. And uh, in the words of Chris Brown, how are you going to hate from outside the club, man? You can't even get in. Let's take care of Dallas tomorrow, and I'll leave you with this. Rockets go bye-bye. Good job, Drew. Good take. Uh, if you are confused what he's talking about with Tari Eason, that was the Rockets player 10 days ago now, something like that, who put on Instagram – uh, he was, you know, kind of screaming, singing, Warriors, come out to play. Uh, I said it a couple of times and was obviously trying to let the Warriors know that the Rockets were coming for them. They're on their heels. Uh, and at that point, they were. I mean, it was getting a little nerve wracking if you were a Warrior fan. However, since then, the Warriors have now won six consecutive games. The Rockets have lost their last three. And uh, the, the Rockets' postseason hopes, their playing hopes, are now on life support. And to add insult to injury, Tari Eason showed up to the game uh, in street clothes because he's been injured since, like, January and is out for the year, has not played uh, at all the last handful of months. He showed up in his street clothes with a custom shirt, black shirt, red font, or maybe it was red and black font. Rockets colors, whichever it, whatever the, the the color scheme was, it was Rockets colors that said Warriors come out to play, and his team lost by twenty three points today. Uh, so yes, Tari Easton's kind of the ire of Warrior fans right now. I know Clay Thompson was having some fun uh, with it post game, uh, and I, I I know the Warriors went up to Tari Easton after the game as well on the court, and they were exchanging words, not in any sort of malicious way, but I'm sure. Steph Curry and Draymond Green were telling young Tari Eason, hey, you better be careful. You know, poke the bear. You're not going to like it. And and that's what happened tonight. The Warriors knock off the Houston Rockets. They win by 23 points in a game where they committed 21 turnovers as a team. And the Rockets scored 27 points off those 21 turnovers. I mean, just imagine if this was a game that the Warriors took care of the ball. As Drew said a couple of minutes ago, if they did not commit those 15 turnovers in the first half, say it was like six turnovers in the first half, they would have been up by 25 or 30 at halftime. If they took care of the ball throughout, this would have been utter domination. The Warriors could have won this game by 40. That's how good the Warriors were shooting the ball. They shoot 58.8% from downtown they barely uh are under 50 percent from deep in the game 17 for 35 clay was a big part of that he made seven of his 11 threes quinones put up three and made them all in garbage time uh to bump up some of the warriors shooting numbers as well meanwhile houston they shoot 42 percent from the field only 30 percent from downtown how about this they put up five more three attempts than the warriors and they made five fewer uh, so they needed five more attempts from downtown only to make five fewer threes than the Warriors did. They go 30% from downtown. The Warriors nearly 50% from downtown. Every single statistical category favors the Warriors in this one tonight, except for the turnovers. So only imagine if the Warriors had their turnovers in check, this would have been even more of a route than it already was because they won by 23 points, 133 to 110. Uh, I think we got to focus on Trace Jackson Davis here. He had his first career 20-point night. He was awesome in this game, Trace Jackson Davis. 20 points, 8 of 10 from the field, 5 rebounds, 4 assists. I've been saying it over and over again, and anyone who will listen, um, I've been telling anyone who will listen, Trace Jackson Davis is an underrated passer. With those 4 assists, he just makes great decisions with the ball in his hands. And I think a... a a combination, a duo that Drew brought up. Uh, it's the the Clay Thompson, Trace Jackson, Davis combination and connection, and it works both ways. There are times where Trace Jackson Davis is feeding a Clay Thompson, you know, three or or feeding Clay cutting. Um, but I think what maybe is more important to focus on is 
Clay Thompson on a night like this, when this is is maybe the closest Clay has felt to his prime self in a really long time. He was a willing passer as well in the second half. There were a couple of really, really nice passes by Clay Thompson to a rolling Trace Jackson Davis that led to easy buckets for the big man. Clay Thompson had four assists tonight. There were a couple that the final Warriors possession of the first half that capped that 9 nothing Warrior run to end the half. It was a Trace Jackson Davis screen on Clay Thompson's man who was handling the ball. Clay was. Clay dumped it off the Trace for a nice dunk. And then the second Warriors possession out of the third quarter, another pick and roll, another nice pass from Clay to Trace Jackson Davis. They just have a really nice connection. And I know uh, Clay likes to joke. Maybe it's not a joke for Clay, but it is funny that he has a connection with Trace Jackson Davis because Trace shares the name and spelling Trace with his younger brother, Trace Thompson, the baseball player, former Dodger, former White Sox, former A, I believe, if memory serves. Um, it, that's what Clay says. But for whatever the reason, doesn't matter what the reason is, those two work really well together both ways. And it was on display tonight. And I think what's interesting about this Warriors lineup right now, and obviously the elephant in the room And it's a great problem to have, but the elephant in the room is that Jonathan Kaminga just missed his fifth consecutive game, and the Warriors have won all five of them, and they've done it in relatively convincing fashion in a number of them. Uh, You beat uh, Dallas at home a couple of days ago. Obviously, I think you, you can make the case the best win of the bunch. Orlando was obviously a really nice win as well for the Warriors. Uh, And then this one in Houston where you dominate and you run the Rockets out of their own gym in a game where they're fighting for their play-in, playoff lives, whatever you want to call it. Um, So the Warriors have a decision to make when Jonathan Kaminga does return, which the Warriors seem to think will be tomorrow in Dallas. However, they thought he would return tonight in Houston as well. So only time will tell. We'll keep you updated all day tomorrow here on 95.7 The Game. Um, But where I think the Warriors don't really have much of a decision to make in terms of the starting lineup is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why are you going to move away from this when it's led you to this win streak? And the the two most recent wins, two of your best performances of the season. Uh, And Trace Jackson Davis is a gigantic part of that. Because the starting lineup, remember, before Jonathan Kaminga went out, it wasn't that Kaminga was, say, starting for Wiggins. It was Kaminga starting for Trace Jackson Davis. The change here isn't uh, one wing over the other. It is going bigger and sliding Draymond down to the four. And the way that Trace Jackson Davis is playing right now on both ends allows the Warriors to do something a little bit different than the lineup that featured both Wiggins and Jonathan Kaminga in addition to Draymond Green which would push Draymond back to the five. It isn't a knock on Jonathan Kaminga. It's not. It's just the fact that this lineup gives the Warriors a little something different. In fact, if I am trying to dive into the mind of Steve Kerr, and we we, we will hear from Steve Kerr coming up in a little bit, if I'm trying to dive into the mind of Steve Kerr and, and try to figure out what decision he's trying to make when it comes to Kaminga's return, and, and what options are running through his mind, for me, the decision that he's making is not Kaminga over Trace Jackson Davis. It, it's Kaminga over Andrew Wiggins. That's the conversation here. I think Trace Jackson Davis is locked into this starting spot because of what it's doing for the Warriors defensively. You've heard Steve Kerr talk about it a lot. Uh, Draymond Green with a legitimate five behind him and a defensive-minded one, a guy that can protect the rim, and Trace Jackson Davis certainly can do that, maybe more so than anybody else on the Warriors roster. It allows Draymond Green to do everything else defensively because he does not have to worry about being the Warriors' only rim protector. He can play center field, as Steve Kerr puts it. He can help out on defense with everybody else, and it allows the Warriors to be that much better across the board defensively when you free up Draymond to play that center field position defensively. Trace Jackson Davis does that. 
if you were to insert Kaminga back into the lineup and take Trace Jackson Davis out, the Warriors defense might suffer a little bit because Raymond Green then is relegated back to the center spot and has so much more responsibility around the rim that he does not have the freedom to go and help everybody else out defensively. So again, I don't think this is some knock on on Jonathan Kaminga, and I'm not even sure what the right answer is. I mean, Wiggins was fine today. He didn't blow anyone away. 10 points, 3 of 8 shooting, 5 rebounds, a couple of assists, committed 1 turnover, uh, 1 of 5 from downtown, certainly not... Uh, up to par as you know his his recent performances in which he's been really good, um, but for me the conversation for the starting lineup and where Kaminga stands at this stage, I'm taking Trace Jackson Davis out of that conversation entirely. It's Wiggins or Kaminga starting at the three. That's the only question left for Steve Kerr to answer. And if I am Steve Kerr, if I had to lean one way or the other at this very moment, I'm leaning with the lineup that's working right now. And unfortunately for Jonathan Kaminga, it's Andrew Wiggins. And I get that it's a little bit awkward or weird, and who knows how Jonathan Kaminga would take that because, I mean, when Andrew Wiggins missed four games for personal reasons and the Warriors were winning all of those games, right, that was the road trip when the Warriors went 3-1. and one, They beat... Uh, the Wizards in D.C., they beat the Knicks in New York, they beat the Raptors in Toronto, then they lost by 50 points to the Celtics in Boston. That was the road trip, the four games that Wiggins missed, and what happened when Wiggins returned from that four-game absence? He went right back into the starting lineup. So how does it make Jonathan Kaminga feel if he returns from his relatively short absence? He's missed five games now. How does he feel if he returns and doesn't go back into the starting lineup? Does that upset him? Who knows? I mean, Kaminga is the guy who at least voiced some displeasure, some discontent, some frustration with Steve Kerr earlier this season. Now, things have since been smoothed over, and things have been great for Kaminga and the Warriors as a result, but who knows how he might take that. Um, But if I am Steve Kerr and the Warriors... If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And right now for the Warriors, it ain't broke. It ain't broke. And there's nothing wrong with having Jonathan Kaminga as your sixth man off the bench either. I mean, considering how well he's played lately, that will give the Warriors an extra punch and an extra level. So we'll see. That's something to circle for tomorrow for sure uh, when the Warriors take on the Mavericks in Dallas. Um, But what Trace Jackson Davis is adding to the Warriors right now He's my starting center for the rest of the regular season and for however many play-in and postseason games the Warriors have. He gives the Warriors another level that they just don't have with anybody else, that no one else on this roster can add. Trace Jackson Davis adds it. He adds it. And, you know, it's it's kind of funny how this all came about because I remember sitting in for, for Mark Willard on Willard and Dibbs a handful of weeks ago now, and and it was the day that Steve Kerr was scheduled to come on. So I had the pleasure of interviewing Steve Kerr, and I remember asking him, because it was in the middle of of Trace Jackson Davis playing well, and I had the opportunity to just straight up ask Steve, like, "Hey, hey, coach, do you think Trace Jackson Davis could be finding his way into the starting lineup, considering how he's playing? And at that point in time, Steve told me straight up, no, because... When you got two non-shooting bigs like Trace Jackson Davis and Draymond Green, it just, it gums up the works offensively. It makes it very difficult for your offense to find space, to get moving, and to score at any consistent level. And I totally, totally got Steve Kerr's answer there. It makes a lot of sense. But I always have thought, And I still think that the Warriors' main issue for the vast majority of this season was on the defensive end. I mean, it was the reason they lost so many games early in the year. You go through the schedule and and you look at some of the losses early 
We're talking about giving up 120 points, 130 points. Remember those consecutive games at home when they lost to Toronto and New Orleans? They allowed 133, then they allowed 141. They allowed 131 the next game and won. Earlier, they gave up 132. They allowed 120 to Denver, 130 to Denver, 126 to Boston. Like, the Warriors' defense has been the issue all season long. And the Warriors' offense, I have the utmost confidence that Steph Curry and Draymond Green and and Clay Thompson, they're going to figure it out offensively. And something's obviously switched or clicked or, or changed Steve Kerr's and the Warriors' minds about it. And it might just be as simple as giving it a longer look and, and maybe the, the analytics change with a little bit of a larger sample size. And the Warriors are leaning into it now, which I think is undoubtedly the right decision and the answer for the Warriors at this stage of the season. Um, but it's kind of funny because the hesitancy from the Warriors earlier, as recently as like two and a half, three weeks ago, was that's a bad offensive lineup. Or at the very least, it's not a good offensive lineup. And if you're going to go to that lineup, you're going to do it for the defense. And while that has clearly worked, I mean, you look at the Warriors' recent wins. Tonight, you allow 110. Now, in today's NBA, that's actually pretty decent. Uh, 100 points in a win against Dallas, 113 in a win against San Antonio. You allow 97 in a win against Charlotte, 93 in a win against Orlando, 92 in a win against Miami. It has been the defense that has turned things around. Um, but, I mean, you also put up 133 tonight. Like, the offense was not an issue at all. And I get part of that is Clay Thompson having a classic Clay heater game. Where he finishes the 29 points and 11 of 15 shooting. Um, but if the hesitancy for the Warriors about the Trace Jackson Davis and Draymond Green duo at the 4-5 was the offensive end, I would I would simply tell the Warriors, do not worry about it. The offense will sort itself out. Put your best defense out there. And that's what the Warriors have been doing, and that's a big reason why they've won six consecutive games, and it's a big reason why, at the very worst, and I know it's not mathematically 100% just yet, but I'm going to go out and say it. At the very worst, the Warriors will be the 10th seed in the Western Conference, and we've got some action above them in the West as well. Six games left for the Warriors. We might see some serious jockeying for the 8, 9, 10 spot in the Western Conference. We can talk a little bit more about that later here on Warriors Wrap-Up as well. All right, 888 888- 957-9570. That's the number to call. It's also the Xfinity Mobile text line. It's Mark Randy with you here on Warriors Wrap Up. We got to get to Steve Kerr. He has already addressed the media post game in uh in Houston. That Steve Kerr press conference is coming up on the other side here on Warriors Wrap Up on 957 the game. If you want to join the conversation again, talk about Clay Thompson's hot shooting. Trace Jackson Davis, a career-high 20 points. And what do you think Steve Kerr and the Warriors do if Jonathan Kaminga returns tomorrow? What starting five do you want? And do you have your sights set on anything greater than the 10 seed? It's all on the table, and it's all coming up. 888-957-9570 as Warriors wrap-up continues. Mark Randy with you right here on 95.7 The Game. The 2024 Mountain Winery concert season is here. Come celebrate our 66th concert season with iconic performances by George Lopez.
93 Jalen Green from 70 feet way strong and an emphatic finish to the third for Trace Jackson Davis of Golden State. Now back to Warriors wrap up on 95.7 The Game. Welcome back. Warriors knock off the Rockets 133 to 110. The Warriors have their first six game winning streak of the season. They had won five games in a row four separate times this year. And tonight, they earned their sixth consecutive win in of the season for the first time this year. As a result, they're now eight games over 500. That is also a season high. They're 42 and 34. They improved to 23 and 15 on the road this year. How about that? 23 and 15 on the road, 42 and 34 in total. They're eight games over 500 and they have guaranteed themselves a winning season. If the Warriors go 0-6, the final six, uh, which we don't think is going to happen, uh, but if they do, they'll finish over 500 still, 42-34 and 34 as we speak right now. And uh, with some other results from around the NBA, let's get you updated on the important scores here really quick. There is only one other game in action right now. The Clippers hosting the Nuggets. Clippers lead by 11 uh, in the third quarter, but the only other score uh, that matters a ton to the Warriors, and it's kind of surprising that this score matters uh, but the Knicks in New York knock off the Sacramento Kings 120 to 109. Pair that with the Warriors 113 to 110 win over the Houston Rockets. The Lakers off tonight, so they did not play. The Warriors gain half a game on the Lakers and a full game on the Kings. The Kings are in eighth. The Lakers are in nine. They're a half game behind the Kings, and the Warriors are a game and a half behind the Lakers. So what does that mean for the Warriors? You're a game and a half behind the Lakers for nine and two games behind the Kings for eight. And you look at who these teams have coming up. The Lakers host Cleveland, host Minnesota, a couple of tough games. Then they host the Warriors. Not an easy one either. They go to Memphis. That should be a win for the Lakers, you would think. And they go to New Orleans. You don't got many gimmies there. Cleveland at home, Minnesota at home, the Warriors at home, in Memphis and in New Orleans. Then the Kings, they've got some tough games as well. At Boston, that's their next game. That's going to be really difficult. At Brooklyn, you feel like the Kings should earn a win there. At Oklahoma City, OKC still in a fight for the one seed, the two seed, the three seed. They should have a reason to try to win that game. Uh, New Orleans at home, that's not easy. Phoenix at home, who will probably be playing for their life in terms of avoiding the play-in as well. And then Portland to close out the regular season. That should be a win for the Kings. But you've got a lot of really tough games for the two teams directly ahead of the Warriors in the standings. Meanwhile, the Warriors have Dallas tomorrow on the road, Utah at home, in LA against the Lakers, in Portland, at home against New Orleans, at home against Utah. So you got two games against Utah, both at home, that you feel like should be wins. One in Portland that you feel like should be a win as well. And then, you know, you, you go two and one in the other three. You could five and one in your final six. You get some luck elsewhere. Who knows what happens? You could jump the Lakers. You could jump the Kings if things go perfectly for you. Um, but it's surprising we're even having that conversation right now uh, because the Kings, not that they've been bad. They've won six of their last 10, the Warriors seven of their last 10, but they have you know racked up a couple of losses here. And the Warriors, uh, as we know now, have won six in a row, and they are on the heels of the Lakers, and they are inching closer to the Kings. So we're going to keep our eye on those Kings I know for a while here on Warriors Wrap-Up, the only games that I've been giving you the scores and the updates for, in addition to the Warriors, of course, had been Lakers and Rockets games. I think we're at a point where we can just about take the Rockets off the list and we can start looking at the Kings and the Lakers because the Warriors are only two games behind the Kings and a game and a half behind the Lakers. And interestingly enough, if you do look at uh, the tiebreakers in those ones, for the Lakers... The Warriors have the 2-1 to head-to-head matchup uh, record right now. If the Warriors win in L.A. Uh, on Tuesday, that's next Tuesday, April 9th, the Warriors will take the tiebreaker over the Lakers. So that's a really important game. It could be twofold because 
You would gain a whole game on the Lakers if you do, and you would win the tiebreaker. And against the Kings, Sacramento will very likely have the tiebreak uh, because the two teams have split the head-to-head matchups, and the Kings have a much better division record at the moment, and it seems unlikely that the Warriors would be able to catch up with them at this stage of the season. So it seems like the Kings would have the tiebreaker, which makes the Warriors jumping the Kings that much less likely, Um, but it is still a mathematical possibility, much more likely than the Rockets catching the Warriors. I'll put it that way. The Warriors have a much better chance to catch the Kings than the Rockets have to catch the Warriors. It is certainly within the realm of possibility that the Warriors could catch the Kings, and they're even closer to the Lakers, and they have a much cleaner path to getting the tiebreaker over the Lakers as well. Just beat the Lakers in L.A. on Tuesday, and you will have the tiebreaker if you finish with the same record against the Lakers and you win in L.A. on Tuesday. You will finish ahead of them in the standings. Now, what is it really worth going from 10 to 9? We could have that conversation uh, because the only difference there is you get a home game in the 9-10 game instead of going to L.A. or going to Sacramento. Uh, you would get a home game if you are the 9, but you still have to win that game and then win the next to get into the postseason. The more valuable jump is getting up to the 8 spot. If you are the 8, you have two cracks, two bites at the apple. You could lose the 7-8 game, and then you still have another game to play, and if you win that one, then you would still get into the postseason as well. So getting to the 8, much more valuable, of course, but it is also that much less likely. But we will be keeping an eye on Kings and Lakers scores the rest of the regular season because the Warriors are within striking distance. If you are curious, above the Kings, the Pelicans and Suns uh, are both a game ahead of the Kings. So the Warriors three games behind both of those teams, and they're sitting in the six and seven spots right now tied. The Suns have the tiebreaker as we speak right now. They are in the six. The Pelicans are in the seven. The Warriors are a couple of spots down from those two and three full games behind. That seems... Very, very, very unlikely. But the Warriors and the Kings, there is, there could be some movement. I'll put it that way. But you would need some help, and you would have to play really great basketball the rest of the regular season to make it happen. But you played really good basketball tonight, and you got the job done in Houston, a game that Houston was obviously fired up for. And I thought it was very important that the Warriors jump out to a, a lead early in this game. And they did that because Houston, we talked about Tari Eason, you know, from the movie The Warriors back in the late 70s, early 80s. I can't remember off the off the top of my head, you know, the famous line, Warriors come out to play. Tari Eason put that on Instagram, screaming it himself, and he wore a Warriors come out to play shirt on the bench tonight because he's been injured and has not played in a number of months. Uh, and Houston was fighting for their play in lives to, to extend their season past the regular season. And so much of the conversation around this Warrior team lately had been, well, Houston just simply cares more about the playing than the Warriors, right? Like, them being the 10 is like nearly them winning a championship. Meanwhile, the Warriors used to winning real championships. They've won four of them. What does the 10 seed even mean to them? Uh, but you could not tell that that was a conversation based on the way these two teams came out because the Warriors punched the Rockets in the mouth immediately, and they led wire to wire. Houston never led. Warriors win 133-110. to They're now four full games up on the Houston Rockets. And, you know, we talk a lot about how the, the lineup is currently working, and tonight it was so smooth a lot of the times, aside from those 21 turnovers as a team. Um, so much of it just has to do with Clay Thompson and what he was able to do tonight. He had 29 points, incredible efficiency, 11 of 15 from the field, and 7 of 11 from downtown. Uh, when the Warriors get that from Clay Thompson, they're very, very, very tough to beat. And then you consider what they're doing defensively with the Draymond Green and Trace Jackson Davis duo. They're hard, very hard to slow down. And you, you kind of get a sense how things got off track, went off the rails a little bit early in the season because of Clay's up and down beginning to the year and him searching, searching, searching for something. But when it hits and when he is on a streak like he was tonight, you just see 
you see that that championship era Warriors basketball again. Like we talk a lot about Andrew Wiggins being the key when he plays locked in and he's playing on both ends. And I thought he did a really good job on Jalen Green tonight. Jalen Green, who, if it wasn't for Luca averaging a 30 point triple double last month, might have been the Western Conference player of the month, averaging like 26, 6 and 6 over a month. He's been awesome. Uh, he wasn't bad today, but only 13 points for Jalen Green. Four of 12 from the field. Guess who was his primary defender tonight? Andrew Wiggins. Andrew Wiggins is certainly a key for this Warrior team, and you've seen it recently. I mean, his last five games, he's put together one of the better five-game stretches of the last two years for Andrew Wiggins. And the Warriors have won all five of those games. It's not a coincidence. When Wiggins plays well, the Warriors are a much better basketball team when Clay Thompson is shooting well, the Warriors are also a much different basketball team. And his shot, it can it can hide, it can disguise a lot of other deficiencies. And not that the Warriors were deficient in, in a number of areas tonight because they really were only deficient in one, turnovers. 21 turnovers as a team turned into 27 points for the Houston Rockets. But Clay Thompson shooting can overcome those deficiencies if you struggle, uh, if, if you commit a lot of fouls and the opponents get to the line, clay shooting can hide that. Um, if if you, you're shooting poorly otherwise, clay and his hot stroke can hide those deficiencies, those misses. When he's hitting the shots like he was tonight, the Warriors are a different basketball team. And uh, you can see why if, if you get any sort of consistent clay, not... Not 11 of 15 every single night, but if you get Clay like going 7 for 13 and 4 for 7 from downtown, consistently, this Warrior team is scary. And we're getting to a point, I'm getting to a point, I don't know how you guys feel, let me know, 888-957-9570. I'm getting to a point where... Let's just say the Warriors were the sixth seed. They were locked into the six, and, and we could safely assume that they were out of the play-in tournament. I would feel relatively good about this Warriors team's chances at, at winning a series. But you get into the, the one game, the, the NCAA tournament style, the, the game seven atmosphere of a play-in game, and potentially having to do it twice from either the nine or the ten spot, winning the 9-10 game and then winning against the loser of the 7-8 game, anything can happen in in one night. Anything can happen in the first play-in game. Anything can happen in the second play-in game. But when you get to a series of basketball games, a seven-game series, first to win four games, you feel a little bit more confident in the Warriors' ability. So really, the thing that is holding me back from potentially being a little bit more optimistic about the Warriors going forward, it isn't that I'm not convinced that they're playing their best basketball of the year right now because it seems like they are. I tend to believe a little bit more in defense and in how it impacts postseason basketball as opposed to offense. They're playing great defensively right now. The reason why maybe I'm not quite as optimistic as their play suggests I should it's because the play-in tournament is a crapshoot. It is, and who knows what could happen. But if the Warriors were out of the play-in, if you could guarantee me they win both play-in games, if, if you magically place them in the 6 or the 5 seed, I'd probably pick the Warriors to win a series. That's how good they're playing right now. So you got to get over the play-in hump. Until you do, it's wait and see. But if you get over that play-in hump, this is a different conversation, in my opinion. So we'll see what the rest of the season holds for the Golden State Warriors. 888-957-9570. That's the number to call. It's also the Xfinity Mobile text line. It's Mark Randy with you here on Warriors Wrap-Up. Um, a really nice night for the Golden State Warriors, and the phone lines are heating up. Jennifer will come to you in just a second here on Warriors Wrap-Up by 95.7 The Game as the Dubs knock off the Rockets. 133 to 110. The Warriors now a four game advantage over the Rockets, 410th in the Western Conference. And with the tiebreaker, you can think of it more as a five game lead with six games to play. It's going to take a collapse of epic proportions and the Rockets to put together another long win streak for the Warriors to avoid the play in. I'm comfortable saying for the Warriors, 
10th seed at the very worst. All right, on to Jennifer on the phone lines we go. It's Warriors wrap up on 957 the game 888-957-9570. Jennifer, what's up? You're on 957 the game. How you doing tonight? I'm fine, thank you. The Warriors, I think we have the um what the talent that it takes to go all the way as during the regular season, Steve Kerr kept pulling out uh, the people that were making a difference. But Trace Jackson, he's he's really great talent for our team. And also, you heard Chris Paul. Everybody's been talking down Draymond, talking down Draymond. Chris Paul, who is a Hall of Famer himself, says up close and personal, Draymond is one of the best defenders of all time. Yeah, Jennifer, I don't think anyone's doubting that. I don't think anyone's ever said otherwise. He's still an incredible defender, and you look at his body of work for his whole career, he's very clearly one of the best defenders this league has ever seen, and for my money, he's one of the most versatile defenders. You haven't quite seen a defender be able to defend like legitimately one through five like Draymond does. I think the conversation around Draymond has more been because he's such a good player and because he's still so valuable, what is increasingly frustrating about him is you need him to be available. And too often he has, through only his own fault, been unavailable. That's why it's so frustrating. If Draymond wasn't as good, you know, his availability, unavailability wouldn't matter as much. Because he's so good, the Warriors need him so badly, he has to be available. Has to be. And that's why Steve Kerr came on this very station and said what Draymond did in Orlando was unforgivable because he's still so important and the Warriors can't possibly win basketball games without him. Jennifer, I appreciate the call. And you're 100% right. I would just say I don't think anyone's doubting his value. We're, we're, the, the only thing that we're hung up on is... Because he's so valuable, he has to make sure he's available, especially down the stretch of this season. And ever since he returned, after he got ejected early against Orlando, he's played really good basketball. I mean, the San Antonio and the the Dallas consecutive games for Draymond, I think that was a message from Draymond to the organization to Warriors fans, to his teammates, to anybody who will listen, like, hey, remember me, I'm still really dang good, and you need me to win basketball games. Good luck winning without me. They don't beat San Antonio without him. They don't beat Dallas without him. Draymond is still incredibly valuable, and as a result, the Warriors need him. So, Draymond, make sure you're available because this team is going nowhere without you. And you might be upset, you might be frustrated, you might be sick of... Uh, you know, the antics, if you want to call it that. And I, I understand. But if you say anything other than um, he's valuable to this team still, when he is available, then I would just flatly disagree with you because the evidence, when he's on the court, this Warriors basketball team is much, much better than they are without him. All right. Warriors wrap up here on 95.7 The Game. Mark Randy with you. 888 888- 957-9570. We're going to hear from Steve Kerr coming up in just a little bit. But first, out to the phone lines we go. Mark is in Berkeley. Mark wants to focus on Coach Kerr. Mark, what's up? You're on Warriors Wrap Up on 95.7 The Game. How you doing? Uh, I thought he did a great job coaching tonight, and he spread the points for everybody. And if he did that, does that against the harder teams, he's going to win a championship. I was very impressed tonight the way he spread the time for everybody. And if you look at the scoring, it was one of the best of the season as far as, and I, and without Kaminga, that's really impressive. Yeah, Mark, uh, it, it was really good. I will say when the Warriors have a key rotation piece out, um, it honestly makes things a little bit easier for Steve Kerr because you don't have as many tough decisions to make. Like if Kaminga was available tonight, and you got to a point where maybe this was a little bit more of a competitive game and it was coming down to the wire and you needed to put your best five out there, what's your best five? Like right now, without Kaminga available, the Warriors' best five is relatively obvious. 
when obviously Steph is always part of the best five, Draymond is always part of the best five. When Clay is shooting like he was tonight, he's part of the best five. Trace Jackson Davis and his career night, he was clearly part of the best five tonight. Really, the only decision you got to make is is Wiggins a part of the best five or is it Chris Paul? Like, do you want to go three guards? Do you want Pajemski in there? Do you want Moses Moody in there? That's a relatively straightforward decision, but you throw another body into it, and it becomes that much more difficult. So uh, I appreciate the call, Mark, and I do agree. I thought Steve Kerr was was great tonight, perfectly fine. But tonight is not a night where he's terribly challenged. I'll put it that way. 888-957-9570. Let's hear from Coach Kerr. Speaking of, this is Warriors head coach Steve Kerr addressing the media after the Warriors win tonight. 133-100 to over the Rockets in Houston. Here is Warriors head coach Steve Kerr. First half, we obviously shot the lights out, but, um, you know, we weren't executing very well at all. Um, So did a much better job in the second half. Uh, Only six, including the one at the end, um, which was a shot clock violation. So better job in the second. Those guys play really hard. Houston plays um, their physical and switch everything, you know, got underneath us. So they forced a lot of those turnovers, but uh, our guys adapted and, and did a good job. The last, the last couple wins, you guys have really touted your defense as the backbone, but tonight, like a lot of offense. What did you see from, from your shooting score and shot selection? Uh, what did I see? Offense? Well, we, like I said, we shot it well. We didn't execute well. Uh, too many turnovers, but um, the key to the game was our defense. So Trace and Draymond together um, have changed our our team. I mean, it's um, it's pretty dramatic. Just the rim protection, the rebounding that, that Trace gives us, what that allows Draymond to do. Um, it's been really fun to watch them together. Trace is, uh, you know, for a rookie, it's um, amazing what he's doing. Yeah, following up on Trace's first 20-point game of his career, how have you seen him evolve uh, just into a more complete player from the start of the season? Well, he's gaining a lot more confidence, I think, with, with the extra playing time uh, here in the second half of the season. And um, he was already a very uh, sound player fundamentally. Um, but... Um, you know, the NBA is different from the college game. You have to feel it. You have to see the pictures and feel the actions people are running, the pace, the tempo, and you got to learn all the personnel, and he's doing a really good job with all of that. This recent win streak along with him a few in a row basically, you know, kind of seals that, that you're going to be in that 10. I mean, it's that. How much did you feel that breathing down your neck, uh, your neck the last few weeks, and how good did it kind of feel to it? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're not thinking about any of that. We're just trying to win. And, um, you know, so we're, we're, we're on a nice run right now and uh, playing good basketball. And we're going to keep doing that for the next six games and see where we land. That lineup with Trace and Draymond together, um, the start of the game hot, close the first half really strong. Again, the start of the second half, it's kind of like a same size with them playing really well. Is it going to be a little bit tough to go away from that five wins once Sean Payton comes back? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, it's uh, you know we've 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 established something here. Um, for years. Um, if we're playing well, we generally keep the same starting lineup. And um, I mean, I've kept Steph and Draymond out of the starting lineup when when, when they've been in that situation. So um, we'll see how we play it. Um, you know, we've got um, some guys banged up. Uh, Wiggs obviously missed the whole fourth. Um, so, I, you know, we'll see how healthy we are tomorrow and figure out our lineup. But, um, you know, my philosophy is always if, if, you're, if you're playing well, you keep doing the same thing. There it is from Steve Kerr. Quote, if you're playing well, you keep doing the same thing. Uh, I think a six-game win streak constitutes playing well. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to translate that coach speak. Jonathan Kaminga, if you're available tomorrow, you're our sixth man. That's what it sounds like to me. We can talk a little bit more about that on the other side. we got to hit a break. Uh, more of your calls coming up on the other side as well. Is that the right decision? Kaminga, sixth man. Wiggins staying in the starting lineup. Trace Jackson Davis staying in the starting lineup. The Warriors dominant tonight in Houston, 133-110. to Give me a call, 888-957-9570. More Warriors wrap-up coming up on the other side. It's Mark Randy with you right here on 95.7 The Game. Matt Steinmetz here and watch you tune in to Steiny and Guru on Monday, April 22nd, as we will be broadcasting live from Stone Tree Golf.
Mm. But I, I want to get to something uh, first. We will get to the standings and we'll run through some numbers and I can show you how the Warriors can catch the Kings. We'll get to that in com coming up in just a little bit. But I wanted to react to what Steve Kerr said before we went to break there. Uh, Steve Kerr asked at the very end of his presser about how difficult it would be for him to go away from this five-man starting group. And that five-man starting group is Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, and Trace Jackson Davis. Jonathan Kaminga has now missed five consecutive games, and the Warriors have won all five of them. It's not as if Kaminga was an anchor weighing them down. That's not what this is at all. It's simply, potentially a case of the Warriors being forced into something because of injury and them realizing, hey, you know what? There's something here. It has happened time and time and time again this season. Think way back to the beginning of the year. Do you remember the game against the Minnesota Timberwolves before we knew this T-Wolves team was great? At home against the T-Wolves, it was the second of two games in a row against them at Chase Center. Steph Curry was out with a minor injury. And then Clay Thompson and Jaden McDaniels got into a swinging match. They were grabbing each other's jerseys and throwing each other around the court. And then Draymond Green came in and put Rudy Gobert in a headlock. And they both got ejected. Draymond and Clay. And Draymond got suspended for the first time that night, this season, for the first time this season. Steph Curry was already out. Suddenly you're without Steph, you're without Clay, you're without Draymond. What do the Warriors do? Steve Kerr's hand gets forced. And he has to play Brandon Pajemski. And guess what? What happens? Pajemski leads the Warriors in scoring that night and almost wills them single-handedly to a win against a team that we now know is one of the best teams in the league. That was not a decision that Steve Kerr wanted to make, that he thought he was going to have to make. He was forced into it. I can say the same thing about um, Moses Moody at one point during the regular season. Now, that hasn't necessarily stuck and he hasn't been a consistent piece of the rotation really at all when everybody's been available. But do you remember that game at home against the, no, on the road against the Kings when the Warriors built like that 20 point lead in the first half and then you, you, you felt it trickling away and trickling away and trickling away and no option was working for Steve Kerr. So what did he do? His hand was forced despite telling Moses Moody earlier that night. Hey Moses, hey Moses, you're not in the start. You're not in the rotation tonight. We're, we don't plan to play you. But then everything went wrong, and Steve Kerr said, ah, "I hate to go back against my word, but Moses, you're in." And Moses hit like three consecutive threes in the fourth quarter, and was a, the only reason the Warriors were still in that game down the stretch. Like that was Steve Kerr's hand being forced. It happened as well. Uh, with Jonathan Kaminga. It was the home game against the Trailblazers. Do you remember when Kaminga was playing so well and the Warriors built the lead? And then for whatever reason, because of the timing of the Trailblazers comeback. Oh, no, this wasn't the Trailblazers game. This was the Nuggets game. My mistake. I was thinking of a different game where Kaminga was not in the rotation. But the Nuggets game, when the Warriors had that big lead and Kaminga was part of building the lead in the third quarter but did not play the whole fourth, and as a result, the Nuggets came all the way back and won that game. And Kaminga's left sitting on the bench wondering, what did I do to deserve this? And then what happened after that? Jonathan Kaminga played consistently. And that wasn't necessarily because Steve Kerr realized, uh, you know, he woke up one morning and was like, Kaminga is the key to this all. It's because he saw in real time his decision not work. And he was forced whether it was inward outward pressure whatever it was he was forced into making a change and this has also now happened with trace jackson davis in the starting lineup the only reason the warriors went to trace jackson davis in the starting lineup was because jonathan kaminga got hurt and was unavailable and they needed a fifth starter and instead of going to pajemski who they've tried instead of going to chris paul who they've tried steve Kerr looked at his bench and said you know what let's give the kid a try and it has worked very well to the point where I think we're going to see Trace Jackson Davis in the starting lineup for the rest of the season and however many postseason games the Warriors play in. Steve Kerr's hand was forced. That's just simply what happens sometimes. Again, it's happened 
time and time and time again. And when your hand gets forced and you kind of stumble into something that works, don't go away from it. Like when Pajemski was forced onto the court because of all those absences, Steve Kerr realized what he had and he hasn't really gone away from him since. Yes, there's been permutations and different lineups and combinations and Pajemski's been starting and now he's not. Like, yes, it's not 100% the same thing every single night, but has Pajemski ever fallen out of out of the rotation since then? No. And ever since that that really unfortunate Denver loss, has Kaminga ever fallen out of the rotation since? No. Other than now when he's been injured and completely unavailable, But I promise you, whether or not he starts tomorrow, if he returns, he will be in the rotation. And now I can say the same thing about Trace Jackson Davis. He is here to stay, I think, in the starting lineup, but at the very worst, in the rotation. And he will be one of the first guys off the bench, no matter what, for the Warriors. But he should be, and I would be willing to bet that he will be starting moving forward for the Warriors. You're forced into it. You find something you weren't expecting. You stick with it. It's, it's that simple, and we've seen it time and time again for the Warriors this regular season. And when I, when I say it, that it's working, I mean, you can just see it every single night now when these Warriors are on the court. You get it with Trace Jackson Davis, 20 points tonight, a career high. Draymond Green doing it on both ends. Clay Thompson, his shot is working. Steph Curry, you know who that is. And, and Andrew Wiggins, despite tonight not being incredible, 10 points in 22 minutes. Uh, Steve Kerr did talk about how he did not play in the fourth quarter. A minor, minor thing there for Andrew Wiggins. Three of eight shooting wasn't incredible tonight, but what he did defensively on Jalen Green, limiting one of the hottest scorers in the NBA over the last like five, six weeks uh, to only 13 points on four for 12 shooting. Andrew Wiggins was very valuable tonight as well. And if it ain't broke, why are you going to fix it? It ain't broke. Don't fix it. There's nothing to fix. So, Jonathan Kaminga, if he's back tomorrow, I'd be willing to wager that he'd be coming off the bench. And it's it's just as simple as that uh, because the Warriors have found something that they did not previously have or expect to have. But they have it now, and they're not going to go away from it. You can maybe argue that earlier in the season, the Warriors were playing better basketball. This is their first six-game win streak, but they had won, like, what, 13 of 16 at one point? It began with that that road trip uh, where they won in Memphis, lost a heartbreaker in Atlanta, then beat Brooklyn and Philadelphia and Indiana, then had the the Steph Curry game winner against Phoenix. They beat Utah. Uh, they beat Utah again going into the All Star break, and then they were playing well out of the break. Like that's another area, probably the only other area you can point to because so much of the rest of the season has been stop and go herky jerky and. One step back, one step forward, two steps back. Um, But this is their first six-game win streak, and they have been great in a number of these games. And now they're stacking some nice wins together. Like the conversation a little bit ago was, well, Miami, in Miami, without Jimmy Butler, without Tyler Hero, like what kind of win is that? Charlotte's bad, San Antonio's bad. Wake me up when they beat somebody good. Uh, They beat Orlando on the road on the back-to-back. They beat Dallas at home. And they just dominated Houston, one of the hottest teams in the NBA in Houston. Now you're stacking some nice wins. The Warriors are playing their best basketball of the year. And if you are not forced into making a change, as Steve Kerr has been forced into making a change in the past, if you're not forced into it, why change it? So I would be surprised if everybody is available. I would be surprised if the starting lineup, when they're all available, again, for the Warriors is not Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Andrew Wiggins, Draymond Green, and Trace Jackson Davis. It seems to be the surefire move for the Warriors at this stage. 888-957-9570. That's the number to call. It's also the Comcast business, or pardon me, the Xfinity Mobile text line. Um, we got a couple minutes left here on Warriors Wrap Up. If you want to sneak a call in, get in now. 888-957-9570. Uh, keeping an eye on the scoreboard right now. Fourth quarter in L.A., the Clippers have a nine-point lead over the Denver Nuggets. But let's get to our hardest worker of the game, which is brought to you by the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, who works hard to serve the community. Are you looking for a career in law enforcement? Learn more about job opportunities at joinacso.com. Tonight is a pretty easy one for me. It's Clay Thompson. It felt like a turn 
uh, back the clock night for Clay Thompson. I said it earlier. This felt like the most 2019 Clay we've seen in a long time. 29 points for Clay in 29 minutes and 15 seconds. He was 11 of 15 from the field, 7 of 11 from downtown, uh, three rebounds, four assists. I love the way he's been passing the ball to Trace Jackson Davis, specifically a number of nice assists. Uh, the majority of them, it seems, go to Trace Jackson Davis. They have a nice connection. And it wasn't just for Clay, you know, hitting the open three, hitting the open shot as he did today. Uh, but it's also the difficult shots that he is making. Uh, he's making a lot of them over and over and over again. There was like a stretch uh, in the second quarter where he just hit like consecutive fadeaway baseline jumpers with a hand in his face. It was really good Houston defense, but Clay was just in that kind of zone where it did not matter. There could be a hand in his face. He could be falling away. He could be awkwardly kind of like, Behind the backboard, he's just in that zone where it does not matter what you do. You're not stopping him. Uh, it felt like prime Clay Thompson at times tonight. He was incredible in this game. Again, 29 points, 11 of 15 shooting, 7 of 11 from downtown. The Splash Bros, they combined for 58 points on 20 of 29 shooting, 9 of 17 from downtown. You get 29 each from Stephen Clay. Uh, the Warriors are still going to be very hard to beat. Uh, if if Stephen Clay put up 29 or more uh, again uh, the regular season, I'm chalking that up as a win. Uh, those two still have enough. When they really have it and when they're going good, uh, the Warriors are still nearly impossible to beat on any given night. So Clay Thompson, he's our hardest worker of the game. Again, brought to you by the Alameda County Sheriff's Office. Okay, before we get on out of here in a couple of minutes, let's run through some permutations for the Western Conference standings, focusing specifically on 8, 9, 10. For simplicity purposes, let's just ignore the Houston Rockets and ignore everybody above the Kings. The Warriors are two games behind the Kings. The Kings are in eight. Warriors are two games behind the Kings. The Lakers are in nine. Warriors are a game and a half behind the Lakers. All teams, uh, let's see, the Kings and the Warriors have six games left. And the Lakers have five games left. So the Warriors, in order to surpass the Sacramento Kings, they have to gain three games on them because the Kings will have the tiebreaker. So the Warriors have to gain three games on the Kings. Let's look at the Kings' schedule. The Kings go to Boston, to Brooklyn, to OKC, and then home against New Orleans, Phoenix, and Portland. All right, let's call Boston a loss. Let's call Brooklyn a win. Let's call Oklahoma City a loss. New Orleans a loss, Phoenix a loss, and Portland a win. That would be the Kings going 2 and 4. 2 and 4 over their final 6. The Warriors in order to pass the Kings would need to go 5 and 1 to catch them. The Warriors have Dallas tomorrow, Utah at home, Lakers on the road, Portland on the road, New Orleans and Utah at home. You would like to think Utah's a win, Portland's a win. Utah's a win. That would mean you got to beat two of Dallas, the Lakers, and New Orleans. If you do that, you go 5-1. and one, The Kings go 2-4. and four, You will finish ahead of the Kings in the Western Conference standings. Now, the other area here is got to also catch the Lakers. If you beat the Lakers in L.A., you get a game, on, a game on them there, and then you also have the tiebreaker, and you'd only be a half game behind if all else was equal. So there is easily a way to find... Uh, the Warriors to surpass the Lakers. It's a little more difficult for the Warriors to catch the Kings, but it is certainly possible. That is the path for the Warriors. Kings go 2-4, and four, lose to Boston, lose to OKC, lose to New Orleans, lose to Phoenix. Warriors go 5-1. and one. The other way, obviously, you could have the Kings lose all of them, and then it would be much easier for the Warriors, but that's very unlikely. Let's say the Kings go 3-3. Three and three. Say they beat... Uh, New Orleans at home. So the losses are to Boston, OKC, and Phoenix. The, war the Kings go 3-3. Three and three. That would mean the Warriors would have to go perfect 6-0 and oh to catch them, which is not impossible. That would be a 12-game win streak to close the regular season. That would be really impressive, probably unlikely. But most likely, if the Warriors were to catch the Kings, I would venture it would be a 2-4 and four Kings close and a 5-1 and one Warriors close. That's how it could happen. It's possible. It's unlikely. 
but it's certainly possible. So if you are a Warrior fan trying to root on the Warriors to pass the Lakers and to pass the Kings, which is definitely worth rooting for, getting to the eight is very valuable and very important. That means you have two bites at the play-in apple. You could lose one and then win the other and still go to the playoffs. It is worth chasing if you're the Warriors. And if you see the Kings lose to Boston, oh, maybe they trick one away in Brooklyn. Giddy up because the Warriors will be chasing for that eight seed. It's possible, and it's kind of crazy we're talking about it being possible because about a week ago, 10 days ago, we were scared that the Warriors might not even make the play-in. And now there is a legitimate path, not an easy path, but a legitimate path for the Warriors to being the eight seed in the Western Conference. We will keep an eye on that as the season continues. Warriors back in action tomorrow in Dallas. It's a 5.30 tip. That means coverage begins at 4.30 right here on 95.7 The Game. And I'll have Warriors live alongside Dan Dibley. I'll be filling in for Mark Willard tomorrow. So it'll be Dibs and Grandy with you beginning at 2. We'll take you up until 5 o'clock with Warriors live beginning at 4.30. Should be a ton of fun. But, of course, we got a lot of great programming before that in the day with Steiny and Goo, 10 to 2 in the morning roast. Early, of course, from 6 to 10 in the morning as well. All right, that'll do it for us today. Here on Warriors Wrap-Up on 95.7 The Game, for Sterling Bennett behind the glass, my name is Mark Granny signing off. Thanks so much for tuning in. The Warriors beat the Rockets 133-110. to The Warriors now a season high, eight games over 500, and they have won six consecutive games. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you tomorrow right here on 95.7 The Game. For the ones who work hard to ensure their crew can always go the extra mile, and the ones who get in early so everyone can go home on time. There's Granger, offering professional grade supplies backed by product experts so you can quickly and easily find what you need. Plus, you can count.